I think I, well... Hey, R.K., what the hell... How do you explain something like that? How do you? Now, if you can explain it to us, I think we can believe yeah. it. <laughs> All right. Uh, he said that they saw a light here, a green light here, I think it was, and red light here, and then in between a no, glow. A white and blue light. All right, white and blue then. Blue and white and white and black. And then a red glow, and McFadden said, is there sort of a red glow in through here? Holes in the side of a sulfur color. And, uh, I mean, I and he described he brownish kook, and he says, no, he's not a kook. He saw what he saw. Well, no, he's I, I, don't think he's, I don't think he's a kook at all. Two cases at Dexter and at Hillsdale. I am not, I wanted, to, here's one part I do want to read. I want it clearly understood that I'm not making a blanket statement to cover the entire UFO phenomenon over the past 20 years in this and other countries. I'm discussing only the Dexter and Hillsdale sightings and then only that material which I have been able to sift down and to uh, that which forms a consistent picture. Doctor, could you face this way more? Yeah, all right. Thank you. Um, for instance, the groups of reports came in over several days from different localities. Many of these have nothing whatsoever to do with the sighting at Hillsdale and at Dexter. Now, for instance, yesterday there was released to the press, and I want to make this completely clear that this has nothing whatsoever to do with the two cases I'm discussing. This picture was released of the rising moon and Venus. This was taken not at the time of the Hillsdale sighting. It was taken several days earlier, not in the evening, but at five in the morning, at Milan, Michigan, not in Dexter or Hillsdale. This shows you how these sort of investigations can get completely Sorry, so mixed up. Milan, M-I-L-A-N, Milan, Michigan, not in a swamp, not anywhere near a swamp, but this is without question Venus and the moon. Any competent astronomer would uh, confirm that. However, I don't want you saying that the Air Force is trying to cover up with a picture of Venus and the moon. This has nothing to do with the Hillsdale and um, Dexter cases, but it was thoroughly confused by the release made yesterday. Similarly, in Hillsdale, there have been recently, again, nothing to do with the sighting of March 21st. Uh, several boys have been um, purchasing flares and using those. I am not using that as an explanation, but as an illustration of what happens when a thing like this gets going, a real UFO flap. Now, I said here in this statement at the end that uh, I emphasize in conclusion that I cannot prove in a court of law that marsh gas is the full explanation of these sightings. But it does appear to me extremely likely, and furthermore, I must read to back this point up the, as I've said here, um, said that I am, after all, an astronomer and not a chemist. And I've pointed out that swamps are not the normal province of the astronomer. <laughs> he usually has his eyes trained toward far loftier places. Yet the famous Dutch astronomer Minert, in his book Light and Color in the Open Air, has this to say about swamps. He describes lights that have been seen in swamps by the astronomer Bessel and other excellent observers. The lights, he says, resembles tiny flames, sometimes seen right on the ground, sometimes floating above it. The flames go out in one place and suddenly appear in, a, in another, giving the illusion of motion. No heat is felt. The lights do not burn or char the ground. They can appear for hours, this is all a quotation, they appear for hours at a time and sometimes for a whole night. Generally, there is no smell and usually no sound except the popping sound of little explosions, such as when a gas burner ignites. This is precisely what was observed there. There were yellow, green, and uh, red lights that always were around a definite locale. They moved up and down and sideways, but they were always there at the 
uh, at that particular locale. In the Dexter Swamp, for instance, while Mr. Manor and his friends were observing the glow from their porch, Fitzpatrick and McFadden were over on the other side of the swamp. They saw the glow to the south, he saw it to the north. Uh, it was very well pinpointed. Uh, Did any of these people actually see a definite shape, though, Doctor? That's a good point. I've uh, uh, got that covered here someplace. Uh, the, the majority of observers in both cases have reported only lights, red, yellow, and green, silent, glowing lights near the ground. They have not described an object. Even the only two observers who did describe an object have stated that they were no closer than 500 yards, better than a quarter of a mile. Now, I doubt that one could make out much detail at that distance at night. It was a dark night, no moon, and by the way, the winds were fairly calm, which would be again conducive to this sort of thing. Well, doctor, isn't it uh, the nature of swamp gas to remain close to the ground, and especially during a thunderstorm, wouldn't that keep it down? Some of these witnesses have told us that they've seen it uh, hundreds of yards in the sky. Well, some, one or two witnesses did say that, but the great majority, again, you must remember that I've sifted down all the many, many reports. I've been talking to these people day after day. Uh, <laughs> You cannot simply take every statement made and give it credence. You have to, to get the least common denominator of these statements. And when you do that, then the, all of it, I was able to get from them that the lights appear to rise somewhat and descend, not many times, a few times during the course of the evening. Both the Hillsdale girls and the people at Dexter described the glow of the lights behind the trees as though they were, they would get brighter and dimmer as though stage lights were being turned up with a rheostat, as they do in stage lights. None of them, except those two people, Mr. Manor and his son, no one else described an object, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Are you saying, Doctor, that Michigan is now producing non-existent saucers? <laughs> well, it's uh, one way of putting it, I suppose. Doctor, Doctor said, how, many, uh, how many people did you expect? Several oh, dozen, all told. Doctor, many, you several heard. dozen. Several dozen. Doctor, you refer in your statement to the will of the wisp. Is there a difference between this and the marsh gas? Or was this another will of the wisp? That's a, it's, a, it's another name. Miasma is another name. Sometimes uh, I believe, but I'm not sure of this, Foxfire. I believe that is another name for it. Doctor, is there a possibility that flying saucers do exist, though? Uh, it depends on how you define this now. What do you mean by a flying saucer? An unidentified object from outer space. I think that's the popular conception. That would be the popular conception. I have no, certainly I have no scientific evidence that this is so. And I would, I would be delighted to have some, really, if, if I could. Uh, it would just think how exciting it would make things. If you identify a flying saucer as something which the Air Force has put up as experimental uh, material, what would your answer be? Is there any evidence that they exist? Well, if it, if it is, it would be... Uh, something that I don't know about since um, I'm, I'm just an astronomer and I'm not privy to all the things that go on in the government, Air Force, or anything else. But uh, uh, I don't know very honestly. I just don't. Doctor, I wonder if you would take a look at this picture and tell me if that is a flying saucer or not. Or well, this is certainly reported to be uh, a picture of a flying saucer, but uh, this. Um, how do you, what can you tell about this? How was it taken? Under what conditions? This could, this looks to me very much like a chicken feeder. <laughs> with a, a brooder, the lights I mean, underneath it. it. <laughs> and, uh, hold it up, Doc. Anybody can, to your face. anyone can, uh, can fake things. <laughs> Doctor, you said that these uh, marsh gases are silent, yet it, uh, there were sounds described as a ricocheting bullet by at least one of the witnesses. Yes, but one of the witnesses, there was that description, although I didn't say it was silent. I said in the statement here that it's frequently like a popping noise as the gas ignites. Now, whether popping can be described, let's remember in this thing that I am not talking about the whole subject of UFOs. I was sent here to check these two particular cases. And uh, the whole subject of UFOs, I pointed out, I think, and I have, let me, let me mention here that I have recommended in my capacity as scientific consultant that competent scientists quietly study such cases when evidence from responsible people appears to warrant such study. 
there may be much of potential value to science in such events. We know a very great deal more about the physical world in 1966 than we did in 1866. But by the same token, the people in the year 2066 may regard us as very incomplete in our scientific knowledge. We must not, in our haste to have answers, be Freddie Smith. Now, somebody ask me who Freddie Smith was, please. All right. <laughs> who was Freddie Smith? Frederick Smith was a physicist at Oxford who discovered, when working with a discharge tube and a, it was a Crookes tube, that when he placed photographic plates near the discharge tube, they got fogged. His great scientific conclusion from this was, and he so instructed his assistants, don't place photographic plates near the Crookes tube. Thereby, he did not discover x-rays. He left it for wrenching because it was x-rays. Now, had he had the scientific curiosity to pursue that point, he might very well, well, he would have been, certainly have discovered x-rays. Now, um, I have been talking about these two particular cases. I think, honestly, were...